Uh, welcome everybody to the, today's meeting with the makers of Lucas. Please, Lucas. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, just to repeat, I mean, yesterday we went through some basics. Just wanted for those of you who had to leave, just wanted to repeat that the general schedule is we did a, the basics yesterday, and then we'll talk about deterministic sequence models uh, now in the morning, and the first hour in the afternoon, and then we'll talk about autoregressive sequence models and the transformer uh, today in the afternoon, and tomorrow in the morning we'll cover more of the universal transformer and of some outlook about reinforcement learning and new things happening in deep learning. Uh, so that's the schedule if you want to decide when to come. I hope that helps, or just ask. Uh, uh, I hope every one of you was here yesterday, so we went through some introduction and did the basics, like what are neural networks in the old school, in the new school, and how to write them in TensorFlow. So you remember, TensorFlow creates these graphs and then runs them, uh, and we went through some uh, we went through some TensorFlow code and connected to a collab and you ran a model on MNIST and it seemed to work. Uh, so if you forgot this collab, then I think it would be a good time to uh, let me write down the link again. Um, I made some changes, so it would be a good idea if you made a copy yesterday to make a new copy today. Uh, and if you were not here yesterday, it might be a good idea to take a look at that and run through it. Uh, so to, for those who are not here, Colab is a website that connects to a machine. You can select the runtime type and connect to a machine with a GPU, and then you'll be able to run uh, the stuff and train some models of, on your own. Uh, so we'll be using this today again. I, if you already forgot, in the meantime, you can reconnect and run it all. Uh, so we made a simple model, one hidden layer, one output layer, uh, trained some MNIST data with digits. And it turned out that, you know, on this simple model, various optimizers work. Uh, Two layers is fine, with more layers there were some problems in training. Uh, initial, yeah, like, uh, we changed the nonlinearities to tan h and sigmoid. That also seemed to work fine. Um, and we did some tuning in a distributed fashion. It's a lot what you do in deep learning. And, uh, and the results, we were putting them in this shared doc, so it's also uh, good to remember for later. Um, so that was all, the task was you get on input an image, which we represented as a vector or a tensor, and if it was a tensor, then by convention it was of this shape, right? There is a batch size, a height, height width, and some number of channels which is often also called depth. Um, so for MNIST images, they're 28 by 28. So we just represented it as one tensor, 700 something, multiplied it by a matrix, um, and had a nonlinearity. And the one we were using most is ReLU, which is exactly this function, and it seemed to work, right? So since this easy task works so well, uh, the question would be, uh, maybe we can do something a bit more ambitious, right? And the things we did was take an image, generate a label. Is it a zero, is it a one, is it a nine? One of 10. Um, but what we really want, right? We don't want to just generate labels. We want to generate complex objects. We want to generate sentences. We want to generate images, videos, music. So 
how do we represent complex objects in computer science? We represent them as sequences, right? So instead of just generating one label, we want to generate a whole sequence, a sequence of bits or a sequence of digits, right? Let's think of a sequence of bits. So how can we do that with a neural network? Well, you know, we had some layers. They generated one thing. We could have some layers and generate multiple things. So for in the morning today, we will consider the following problem. We will have a sequence on input, and we will be generating a sequence of the same length. And the sequence will be a sequence of either bits or digits, right? Think a sequence of digits. So um, take a look at these slides, right? And think a little bit about, in general, the problem we are trying to solve here. We will have some sequences on inputs, like 1, 0, 1, 1, whatever, right? 1, 0, 0, 0. And we will have some sequences on output. And what this neural network will see is just a number of examples of this input-output pairs. Abstracting away from what this neural network is and that it is a neural network. Um, OK, so take a look at these sequences. Can you tell me what is this pattern? OK, so here it is reversing. Great. It was somehow easy. Everyone seems to agree. Um, what is the pattern here? Copying. OK. What is the pattern here? Yeah, so nobody, <laughs> nobody knows. Um, but the point is, <laughs> the point is, any answer you give is exactly as correct and incorrect as you want, because these are just four sequences of numbers. Anything that fits these four examples is the right pattern, and everything that does not is not, right? There is no one answer. I think the pattern I had in mind was that this is a number written lower endian in binary. This is another one, and we're multiplying them. But you know, go figure. <laughs> of course, if you have more examples, and if you're trying to find like a short pattern, you will kind of be converging on the proper one. Um, but in general, this is not a task that you can say, oh, there is one solution, right? Um, and also, like when I say, if you have more examples, you'll be converging on one. What if this data is noisy? What if some of the examples are actually wrong? Would you select a, a, you know, a shorter pattern that's wrong, uh, that says that 7% of the examples are wrong, or a more elaborate pattern that says that 5% are wrong? <coughs> there is no clear answer to this problem, um, but there is at least a sketch of an answer. And the sketch of an answer um, is known uh, in, in the domain as like the minimal Kolmogorov or Solmonov complexity of a pattern. And the answer is as follows. Try to find a program, computer program or a Turing machine, you know, whatever, that takes this input and generates this output. And because you're supposed to choose one, choose the shortest one in any programming language you pick. Uh, and you know, up to a constant, this programming language will not matter. And you can make versions of this, like choose the shortest one that runs in polynomial time, or anything like that. Uh, and then you can ad adjust this notion to, to settings which have errors and probabilistic mistakes. So that's what people have been kind of considering as the definition of the right pattern. Um, nevertheless, as we'll see, it's a definition. It's good to have it in mind. It's not exactly what <laughs> seems to be practical. OK, so now the task we are looking at is given these input-output input, output sequences, we are trying to find a program uh, in the form of a neural network in this case that will map the inputs to the outputs. So great, but neural networks, especially if they have like three layers, they're not very powerful computers. Like, what can a neural network compute if it has one layer? Well, it takes the inputs, has some vector representation, adds and multiplies, 
applies this one nonlinearity, adds and multiplies, and outputs something. Uh, so now, what computational complexity class does this fall into? Who has done computational complexity recently? Here. No students? <laughs> so is, is this right? We're, we're talking about, we have some inputs. It's a sequence. We embed it into vectors of floats. And then we do some computation, say a convolution. So we'll only look at like the three fields here. So we multiply by weights here, add, apply the ReLU, maybe do this a few times and output something here. So is this polynomial time computable? Yes, because we've applied many operations. But, you know, so. Now, if this has length n, what's the complexity of actually computing this? Well, like if this has three layers, let's say, right? And this has, like there are only three, three things here, so this is something like, you know, n times three times, like whatever, this height, so a constant, and that's it, right? So it's definitely linear time computable. And in a way, if you went into parallel complexity classes, this is very parallelizable, right? Because like this thing is not looking at this. So it, it's not n steps re of recurrence, it's really just three layers of parallel computation, which is weaker than sequential computation of n steps. So in particular, um, for people, I don't know, are you interested more in like complexity classes? So who, who has heard about a class that's denoted like this? Okay, just, just a few people. So maybe we will not go into this, but so these are threshold circuits. It's a known complexity class that actually corresponds to uh, something what's happening here. Um, uh, but I will, okay, I, I will not go much into it in this case. But it's, it's much weaker, like, or at least it's thought to be weaker than just polynomial time or linear time. Um, so here is the point. Like, I'm trying to compute something here which is like multiplying numbers in binary. So I think there is no known linear time algorithm for that, and probably we doubt that there is one. So if I have a network like this, it cannot do it, most probably, right? No matter, it doesn't matter how good I am at finding the weights, how good an optimizer, how well I tune. No, if I tune perfectly, it will still not work because I'm trying to make it do a task that it cannot do. Hmm? How would you relate to this uh, more uh, historical classes like this and other simple classes? Well, so yeah, I, I, I thought of it, but. So, the reaction, I think, was that actually the reaction that opposed to this historical So, who know what is AC0? This is from a given one with degree in computer science math. No, you're very wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, but I, I see a lot more people know. So AC0 is a class that's computed by circuits where in the gates, right, you have an or or and or, or XOR, right? Um, so threshold circuits are exactly like AC0 except you sum and threshold instead of computing send and or. So one problematic thing for AC0 is that you No, thresholding, it, it actually doesn't matter what you choose for the thresholding. So you can choose, you know, the sum is bigger than a constant, then it's one, or otherwise it's zero. So the, the circuits operate on, they can operate just on bits, right? That's zero or one. And if the sum and the weights can be like zeros and ones are enough, I think. 
Uh, but the point is, so you might think, oh, the neural networks operate on real numbers. Does it matter? No, it does not. So any, uh, th there were papers studying it like many years ago. Any nonlinearity that's like continuous in some sense and not unbounded can be reduced to the threshold circuit, with, like adding some layers. So you can think that the activations and weights are actually bits. And so there were many papers in theory studying like if the, how true the sigmoid must be to like do this. But what you should remember, these neural networks, they can train when these things are like three bits or five bits. So nowadays, all of these things are very close to bitwise circuits anyway. So TC0 is an abstraction of, of this where there is a real threshold and it's zero if it's below and one if it's above. But Yes, yes, taking sigmoids, taking tan h's. Um, but this is a different class than this because like one problematic prob thing for the AC is parity, right? While for threshold circuits, it's not a problem at all. So what's the, what is the parity for, for threshold distance? Um, There isn't. So this is a more powerful class than this. Well, I think there are very few separation results known for threshold circuits. As um, if you have like four layers, they could go as high as p space. <laughs> so. Very little is known in the sense of proved theorems. So for AC, at least, you can prove a hierarchy, right? For TC, depth hierarchy is, uh, is open. Um, yes, and well, uh, yes, basically, I guess everything is open. Uh, nevertheless, it, it's strongly believed that it's a <laughs> weaker class than uh, Not really. So, you know, in, in circuits, you always have this problem. So circuits have an input of a fixed size. And then you ask, so how if we want the size to be variable? And the answer is you usually say the circuit is connected in so, constructed in some uniform way. And how uniform? Well, there is a program that's running in polynomial time that builds a circuit. Or it's a formula or whatever. So uh, I don't want to go into it too much, but... Uh, yes, the, the, the point is the circuit must be constructed in some computable way for every different length. Well, recurrence changes the picture a lot. Yeah, Yes, yes, you're just. But what about uh, recurrence? Different classes, no? Oh, well, recurrence, yes. So we will come into it. But of course, if you do this recurrently many times, like n times, then you're in n squared, right? And if you do this, you know, 2 to the n times, uh, <laughs> then you're in <laughs> n times 2 to the n. So the moment you start doing this recurrently, the picture changes. And it's very easy to show that if you're allowed to do this an ar arbitrary number of time, you can simulate a Turing machine. Because, I mean, a Turing machine just looks at three things, right? One thing's on the left, the state, and the one thing's on the right, and just is allowed to write. Um, so, um, so yes. So the moment you start doing recurrence, which will start in a moment, the picture of complexity changes a lot. But if you just have a fixed number of layers, like three, then there are some things you probably simply cannot compute. I say probably because maybe we cannot prove it, but everyone believes that <laughs> it's not dual. OK, so, so we have a problem like this, where we have numbers written in binary, some symbol in the middle, and we want a neural network that would multiply them out. 
and that would really learn the algorithm to, for doing that. So this is a harder problem because this network has to compute really much more than just a few layer network can do. Um, so one problem is how do we devise a neural network that can do this? And as Henrik already said, maybe we just add recurrence here. But that's the problem, just how do we make something that's expressible enough? The other problem is will it learn? Because the neural network, as we went through yesterday, is trained with gradient descant. So you know, gradient descant, when I was at school, it was like you start here, then you go here, and maybe you're lucky and you end up here. Uh, but you know, there can be many local minima, like the way I used to think about gradient descant was, well, maybe it can find a reasonable minimum of a simple function, but if something is very complicated, like the space we would be searching here is the space of all programs that are in a certain complexity class. So that feels like a reasonably complex space. So it would feel like gradient descant might not be enough. And especially if you've read like papers on program synthesis, um, the problem is considered complex in the sense gradient descent is like this quite simple idea that you just go and minimize a function by following the gradient while finding programs like, uh, have you ever tried to give students the exercise to write a program that does long multiplication? So I did this once. And let me say it was not a 100% success rate. Have, have you ever written long multiplication? It's a, it's a reasonably tricky program thing to write. Right? You need to like add long numbers. And then you need to make sure you're uh, multiplying out and shifting. Right? You need some memory. So we're trying to find something that's not entirely obvious. And it feels like gradient descent might totally not be the right method. So a few years ago, I set out to show these neural network people that they will totally fail. I thought long multiplication is the one problem where I'll formulate it as a neural network, and it will just not learn to do this. Um, but I wanted to be fair to the neural networks and give them a problem they could actually solve. Um, so back at the time, so as, as we said, to have any chance, the neural network will have to have some recurrence. And back at the time, the neural networks with recurrence, were known as RNNs, uh, did recurrence like this. They had an input, so this is our sequence here on input. And then they had a cell, which also has a state. And they produce an output one at a time by reading this input and the state. So let me write these RNNs here. We have our input sequence. So we have input 1, input 2, input n. And we have state 0, which is a state vector. And state 0 is usually a vector of zeros. Right? So think about the input as already a vector. The state is a vector. And then the cell constructs state i plus 1, which is a nonlinearity applied to some weight matrix multiplied by the concatenation of state i and input i. Um, so this is a nonlinearity. This is a linear layer. These two vectors just get concatenated. Um, this is the next state, and this can also be the output. So now that's the simplest RNN cell you can imagine. The problem is if you apply it for a number of steps that's long, the gradients don't propagate too well. Because it's like we saw yesterday, even with four or five layers, it's hard to train a network. And this has as many layers as the length of the sequence, so it gets very hard to train. But there is a trick to help with this, um, for example, you add SI. 
the easiest trick, then the gradients propagate better, and then there are better tricks which we will talk about later. Yes. Well, so I wanted, no, I wanted to have a problem that's reasonably hard and an architecture that can solve it in principle yeah. and that would be hard to optimize. So this was the architecture used at the time and it's still used. Uh, it works very well for natural language problems, so other sequence problems. But now, so, okay, so we have the architecture, the cell is, again, a, a few layer network, but now we have recurrence over the sequence. So now what can this architecture compute? Can it compute multiplication? What do you think? Well, is this Turing complete? So it has an input, it computes something with, with the circuit and outputs the first thing of the output, and so on. It has recurrence, so its computation time is like, this is a constant time computation inside here. This is time n, so it's still linear time. So that's a, already a problem for multiplication. No? Uh, what memory complexity does it have? Yes, well, so these are vectors of constant size here, right? Like some hidden size, 128, 1000, whatever, but it's a constant memory that's kept here. The constant memory and a constant memory. So in addition to the input, this thing is using only a constant vector of the state, right? So it has a constant memory complexity that's very worrying. I've never seen a multiplication algorithm that uses only a constant memory in addition to the input. I cannot prove that it doesn't exist, but maybe that's doable even. But it's very risky, right? In principle, this thing, if you think about the vectors here, oh, sorry. If you think about the vectors here as state of an automaton, then what this is is basically a finite state automaton going over a sequence and outputting things as it goes. Right, so it's a very nice architecture and believe it or not, but you should, this can actually translate from English to German at a very reasonable uh, accuracy. But it cannot, as a computational architecture, compute many really complex functions. It has recurrence, so it compute, can compute more than just a single layer like this probably, but it still is, very improbable that it would compute multiplication. And it's definitely not Turing complete. So it has variable size input, variable size output, uh, but the computational power is limited, definitely by the memory size. So how can we make an architecture that's really universal, that, that, that would have a chance? And one answer is, let's have these cells, but let's have an external tape to which we read and write. So that's called like a neural Turing machine. Uh, you know a Turing machine, right? It has a tape, it has some control, and it just reads and writes. So we take an RNN like this, and in addition to having the processing in the cell, we have a separate tape, which is a variable size vector, and we need to do these reads and writes, and they're usually done by something called attention. Now, I don't want to go into attention now. Uh, I, I will, we will cover it in the afternoon uh, in much more detail, uh, but the idea is you have this li large memory vector, you have your constant size state, then you make a query which of these are most similar to this vector, the query is soft so you can differentiate through it, and these are the positions where you read and write from. So that allows you to uh, make something that's in principle as powerful as a Turing machine, meaning universal, 
except it's very hard to train. Because at every step of the network, it's reading and writing one thing, and it has to back propagate through all these reads and writes, through all these operations that are totally unknown at the time, because it has only input and output examples. So, and also it has this tape thing, which it needs to learn to use. So it's an architecture that's, yes, universal, but it's very hard to operate with. Um, and if you think about long multiplication on a Turing machine, well, for one, it would be very cumbersome to write, but for the other thing, you'd really need n squared, or like with a more complex algorithm, n to some power, uh, less than two but higher than one, uh, of operations. So you'll be training on that, and you'll have to back propagate through this n squared steps. So even with a lot of tricks to make the gradients meaningful, they'll actually disappear. It, it will be very hard to train. Um, so, right, so that, that's what I was, again, telling about the RNNs. They have a constant size memory, and while they can process inputs of arbitrary length, uh, they, uh, they're limited here. A Turing machine, because it has the access to the tape, it has a variable size memory and variable size processing, so it's universal, but, um, but hard to train. Um, so here is an architecture uh, that we came up with. So we will do normal convolutions like we did yesterday, right? Well, yesterday it was fully connected, but let's do convolutions on the input, but do them in a recurrent fashion so we have a recurrence here. Okay, so that's an architecture that, that we call the neural GPU. And again, because we have this recurrence, there will be a problem with vanishing gradients. Um, so, what is the problem with vanishing gradients? Same as in RNNs, if we have a nonlinearity over some network has a weight matrix, and we apply it recurrently, so we apply it for some examples, maybe a few times, for some examples, a hundred times. And then we want to back propagate through it. You saw yesterday, practically, that even four or five layers, how many layers was it? Was three still okay? Four was a problem to train? Yes, so even four layer network was already not training every time. If you have a hundred layer network with hundred nonlinearities, it will be very bad to train. So let's, uh, let's just write it down to see why. Um, so we have x1 is f of wx, right? One layer network, easy to train. Now x2 is f of w uh, wx, right? Two layers. So, now we're back propagating through this. If this is a ReLU, it cuts down some gradients, right? The gradients of a ReLU is a one and a zero. So at some part of your inputs, it's just zeros, meaning the gradients vanish. Is it clear what I'm saying? So the ReLU function is max zero x. The gradient is like that. So on this part, there is no gradient. There is no information. The thing just disappears. So now here, it disappears on some parts. And that's OK. Let's say some percentage disappears, non-zero. Here, it will disappear more, right? 
It does it twice. Here it does it three times. If you think about it, with, I mean, of course, it could be like the same things that disappear. But if you think a little, like if you think just that every step 10% of the things disappear, then after 10 steps or 20 steps, you have a very tiny fraction left that gets any gradient. Now, since it's the same weight matrix, since it's shared, so it will be getting some gradients at the top layer, but very few at the last one. So it'll basically be learning to like do the last step, but that, that cannot help. So now, how can you improve upon this? And the thing that people found out, it's the easiest thing to do, is instead of doing just f of wx, you add x. So now your single step Now it looks like that, right? In, in other words, if you, if you draw it in the neural network, it's like you have your convolutional layer, and you just add the input again. So this adding of the input, it's called the residual connection. Oh, subscripts. Oh. Uh, yeah, I probably. Uh, did I let me erase this because we didn't change it? And you're saying that I forgot something here? Okay, so what we mean is x plus 1 is wxt plus xt. Okay, and if we say x1 is 0 plus x0, and x2 is plus x1, so that's Where is the missing bracket? Here? Yes. No. No, because it should be W times F of W is zero, and then there should be a W bracket. Uh-huh, this one is misplaced. Yeah, and now in zero it should be multiplied by W also. Mm-hmm. Now we're good. Great. So now why did we do this? Um, let's think about the derivative. Now that's our output. So first of all, there is a derivative coming exactly at this thing, at the inputs. And there is a derivative coming exactly at this in a single step, right? So this thing that depends just on the input with one matrix multiplication is getting an immediate derivative even after 100 steps uh, of this time-wise connections, right? But there is this more complex things that we were computing uh, that's also getting a derivative. So this is all fine, except if you do this very much, like things about Think about, so these are vectors, and think about their norms. If they had norm one, 
and these operations were kind of norm-preserving, then here you would have already like adding three of them. So it could be that they'll increase and increase. So there is some normalization problem, uh, which can be solved in different ways. So in image processing network, people add like layer normalization, but um, the solution that was used in RNNs for a long, long time is to add special gates that decides which parts of the vector to forget and which parts to leave going on forward. So, mm -hmm. Um, we will get into it. So, uh, yes, convolutional GRU, we will get into it in a moment. So this is, let's, let's start with this. This is just an equation for a residual layer. And it's called residual because it adds, that's the residual connection, right? It adds the previous one. And it's fine in terms of gradients because now they're coming straight back from the output to the input layers. But it has these normalization problems, right? It's growing up, so we are getting everything, but it's not clear what we are forgetting. So the GRU, which is a gated recurrent unit, it was introduced for RNNs to, to help with this uh, forgetting problem, uh, does the following, uh, and it's most the same as written there, so it says there will be a gate, which is a sigmoid of like some w g x t. So that's our gate. Uh, there is our candidate for the next t, next x, which is like the nonlinearity of w c t x, and there will be a reset gate which is another sigmoid of. So we'll construct three things, uh, a gate, a candidate, and a reset. And so if you think about the residual, uh, a resnet, then it would just output uh, xt plus 1 equals ct plus xt, right, in this notation. That's the candidate, and it would just add the previous thing. Yes? Has, that's just a weight matrix. And the F in this case is a tan H, but as you saw yesterday, it doesn't matter all that much what the nonlinearities are. So that's a ResNet. Now, we said it has this problem because it's adding two things. It's growing up. So one solution which is called highway, is multiply the candidate by the gate and add uh, xt multiplied by 1 minus the gate. So the gate, uh, sorry, it's a sigmoid, right? So a sigmoid of whatever is between 0 and 1. It's a dimensional sigmoid? It's a sigmoid on a vector, yes. All of these things are vectors. So it will be maybe 1 on some axis and 0 on the others, right? It's kind of softmax, no? Um, no, sigmoid is a number between 0 and 1. There is no softmaxing. It's not like picking one of the numbers. It's on every single dimension. It's 0 and 1. And on those on which it is, it's, it's a gate. So on those dimensions on which it is 1, it will have the new thing. And on those on which it is 0, it will have the previous state. Right? So we have the candidate times the gate plus the old thing times 1 minus the gate.
in a, in a highway network, that's how it goes, right? So wherever the gate, all of these are vectors. So if the gate decides to be one on like the first three dimensions, then it will be the new thing there, and it will be the old thing on those other ones. It's all pointwise. So it's all dimension by dimension. So, so it's like a filter. It will pass through things on some axis and get the new ones on the others. So th this is called a highway network. And a GRU is the gate uh, times the previous one. Uh, and where is our reset? Our, oh, here is our reset. In the candidate, we will, instead of just taking f of w x t, we will have this new candidate uh, of x multiplied by the reset. Well, this gate is not called a reset, but it's, it's deciding what flows forward and what gets reset in a way. <laughs> yes, resets, resets in the sense like here, where are they? Uh, they multiply the previous thing by reset before generating the candidate. So the idea is you have your previous thing you first forget some things, which the reset decides what it is. The reset is sometimes called forget. You first get them off. Calculate the candidate. And then the gate decides which parts will be from the candidate and which will be from the old, older thing. So that's called the GRU gate. And People who were working on RNNs for a long time, they observed that these GRUs are indeed very, a very good way uh, to train networks that, that do like 100 time steps. Uh, these GRUs are very similar to LSTMs, which are long short-term memory units. They work almost the same. It's more like the ones were from Switzerland and the other from Canada. So. Yes, so now a convolutional GRU is exactly the same as GRU, except that you're not multiplying by a weight matrix in these candidates, but you're applying a convolution. So the, the equation, this is the same, except you're not having dense layers that would multiply by weight matrix, you're having a convolution layer in every step. Okay, but the whole reasoning is exactly the same as in GRUs. It's just that we'll be doing this uh, convolution. So one layer of this is like one layer of convolutions, except with this added gating thing that's supposed to help us have many layers and not lose the gradients and not lose the size and norms. And then we do it recurrently. So now one thing I want you to remember is that this GRU is very similar to, to a residual connection, except that it has this gating. And people have been asking for a long time, can you just replace the GRUs with a residual connection? And I would say the answer is not clear. It hasn't worked really well for people. And there were like studies of RNNs trying to do this, and they didn't work. But it might be that the normalization techniques were just not developed enough. So yes.
well, if you have a GRU, right? We, we were, this is the basic RNN example. You have a state vector of a fixed size, and in one step, so in this step, instead now of just this tan HXW plus B, you do a GRU, it has the same problem because a GRU just adds you like a multiply and something, but it still has constant memory. And it's still doing the same. Now, a convolutional GRU does not have this problem because it's operating on a variable sized space. A convolution can be applied to, a, to something of any length and it will give you something of the same length. Right, a convolution, because it shares the weights between things, it's more akin to a cellular automaton. Well, it's finite, but it's now an arbitrary size memory. Because you have, this is your memory. It's arbitrarily sized. The convolution will only read the current element one to the left and one to the right, if it's kernel three. But it behaves in the same way a cellular automaton would behave, right? It looks at my position, one to the left, one to the right, does some of this processing, and generates what's supposed to stand here. So if, if it does it once, it's like one step of a cellular automaton running on this memory, but this memory is as large as you want it to be. And now it's indeed uh, computationally universal, and why? Because, well, a cellular automaton can simulate a Turing machine, right? It decides what to write, what to read, it does this in parallel on every step, but anyway. Uh, this is one step and then it can repeat them as many steps as the recurrence decides to. Okay, so step by step. Uh, is it clear that something that has an arbitrary sized memory here, an arbitrary number of recursions here, is actually universal? Right? Uh, you can imagine a Turing machine. It has a tape, but you can think that it has like the current state and something to the left and something to the right, and it just decides whether to read or write or replace it. So it's like if, if the rule for the cellular automaton here would be like, oh, if, if there is anything other than like the state and the place where I'm operating, do nothing, which can be easily implemented, especially when you have gates like that. And then if there is this state where I'm computing, do whatever, shift it to the left, shift it to the right, read and write. Right, so it's like an exercise that people do in uh, computational theory courses. You prove that this single one thing can do what one step of a Turing machine with this tape on the left and the right and the state here would do. And then you do this recurrently for as long as until it says stop. Okay, so, so, so this can indeed compute uh, Universally, now, the harder exercise is if you have two numbers on this tape written in binary, like in the same as here, so this would be an example of something that's written in your memory, and you only can do now n steps of this recurrent computation, not n squared, just n, can you compute the result of long multiplication of these numbers? So now you have n squared operations because this every single step it has a convolution, so it's doing n multiplies and you have n of these steps. But it's a very parallel thing. It's not like your normal multiplication algorithm where you just you know, write things one, or one under the other. So that's, that's an exercise for more ambitious theory-oriented students. This provided the length of the uh, number is uh, up to n minus one. No, no, the length of the number is arbitrary. And with only uh, n the, the number is written here. Okay. I mean, you have your numbers here. One number, 
times the other number. And you will have as many iterations as the length of this thing. So yes, you will have n of them, but not n squared. So n is the length of both numbers? Yes. It can be done, but how is it done? But the convolution can only see one thing to the left and one thing to the right. Oh, you can do addition in, in n steps, yes. But you need to do in parallel all the n additions and accumulating them. So it's, it's actually not that easy to show. Uh, it's been a paper in the 80s that, that, that showed that in this parallel model, you can do multi. It, it's not that hard, but yes. It's, uh, it's not like the normal algorithm where you're just writing n numbers like you learn at school and you add them up because you don't have the space for n squared uh, things. So everything can be, must be done and accumulated in parallel. Uh, but yes, it can be done. So it's a, it's a computing model that indeed in, in n steps can do a bit more than just a sequential machine in n steps. Um, so yeah, so this is a neural network architecture. And we thought, let's try. Let's train it on long multiplication. And I was really convinced that it will totally fail. Because it was, it's a very simple architecture. That's a conf layer. It's just repeated. Um, well, conf layer with the gatings to, to give it a chance to propagate. Um, nevertheless, so this is another view of this architecture, right? You have your, it should be just one column. Uh, you have your number here, and then you have your convolutions with these gatings, one CGRU layer, another, 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 another. Well, and that's supposed to be your output, done. And yeah, and I thought that will not work, uh, but it did. Uh, so yeah, it learns uh, long binary multiplication, and it's trained on 20-bit numbers. So the total length is up to 40-bit. And with a lot of tricks, it can even generalize to like 2,000-bit numbers uh, without any error on the test set. So now there is a big question, what does it mean to learn? Like, how can you prove that your network has learned an algorithm? Um, and well, I mean, you should construct a formal proof, but um, you know, <laughs> uh, we don't do that. So what we did was we generated a test set of things that are 100 times longer than the longest thing it sees during training. And we thought, oh, if it can solve this test set perfectly, it's done. It's good. Now, the problem is uh, that, and there was an evaluation set which was also of this length, just different numbers. Um, the problem is then people came later and said, well, 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 wait, this is just one set. What if you take a 100 times larger set and make them an longer again? And then they showed, oh, it actually failed. So it hasn't learned the multiplication algorithm. It's too strong a statement to say. But it's learned something very close. <laughs> So it's still, it's still an ongoing task to, to say, well, would we in some way be able to prove that it really works for all lengths? That's not done here. And actually, it fails on a longer thing. Uh, but it does pretty well. And like just an RNN, because it stands no chance, it, it, it fails. So, so this is a, a video of this architecture. <laughs> yes, I will make it play. And so what we will be looking at is the state, meaning on the height, there will be the axis where the input is put. And on the width, it's the activations. It's the channel dimension. Right, because we said we have a vector. So this is the vector. This is every single float of this vector, and it's because it's between minus one. It's between minus one and one, so 
It's white if it's minus one and it's black if it's one. So this dimension is, is the vector. Every single thing of this uh, filtering s uh, stuff, right? While this dimension is your input. So this is the length, this is the vectors. And uh, what we are learning here is this duplicating thing. So we get an input and we are supposed to duplicate it. And now if you look very carefully, we are getting an input here. It gets embedded. The embedding is like it copies, whatever. But try to see that what it's actually doing, it's just shifting it down. There's like a pattern that's being shifted one down in every step. Makes a copy of this pattern and just shifts it down. It's not that easy to see. Uh, maybe someone should get a better, you know, visualize it better. That's a pattern. It's the whole, the whole thing, it's just getting shifted down by one every step. It, it copies some things and just, it leaves, like you can clearly see that this is left, it doesn't change, right? And one thing is being shifted down. So that's, that's how it learned to copy. Um, now reversing is even harder to see what it learned. Um, it actually learned to do a thing of a tape. So it, on, on certain dimensions it's going up, on certain it's going down. The, the, the input is always the same, meaning it gets, this is the input in digits, and it gets embedded into vectors here. So is it a bunch of input, or? The it's just one. And that the whole rectangle is single input, or? The whole rectangle is single input. Are there four uh, There are, no, no, there are like four times something. So in that paper, the embedding was a little bit strange. It's all learned, yes. But, but it's... Uh, so this is running, running, running. And the output is extracted at the end. Right, it's running, 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 running. Yes, and this is the final step, the end step, and that's the output, right, it gets extracted. The, 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 the whole, the left thing. So the, there is a final layer, which is just a linear layer, that extracts the, the output from the whole thing. So what is shown on the right? Um, this is the whole... It's an auxiliary computation. It's an auxiliary computation, yes. So it, it, it should not be left and right. It should just be the whole thing, yeah, all the time. But. Um, yes, yeah, so in any case, like in duplicating, it's clearly learned to like shift something down. In reversing, it's clearly learned like this tapey movement that brings parts up and parts down. Uh, and in the end, it, it reverses. And well, it can learn to add. <coughs> That's like the... Uh, the first uh, thing, and so when you look at adding, let's the the thing in the middle here. So this is one number. These are the learned embeddings of zeros and ones, right? This is the addition symbol. This this one thing in the middle. It's a different embedding. And this is the second number in binary. So what is the output? The output will be a number here that's the result of adding these two, the b binary string. So this will be the second, second region? It, it will be the whole, the whole picture. It will expand to use all of the, all of the things. I did them, yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs>
can't you see? <laughs> so, uh, but as you can see, like it spreads out the numbers because it needs to like combine the digits, right? And then when it starts combining them, it stops changing the stuff and then adds them up and here they are added. Because like when you have two numbers to add them, you like need to shift them to be aligned and then process. Uh, yeah, you could simplify it. The point was to like, you know, not make it too easy because yes, you can simplify addition. It's much harder to simplify multiplication, right? But it, it's clear it's learned like to not change things after some time to, to, to leave them, you know. And then when you try to multiply, well, there is, it's very hard to see anything in there. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, there were things spreading and happening, and yeah. Um, well, I mean, I made the movies, but these are really like the tensors, the NumPy arrays taken out from the. <laughs> so you're sure it's not a random number it, It's not, no, no, it's really, it's really a run of the network. And yeah, and you can see at the end that the things it produces are actually uh, the right results, so. Um, Um, yeah. I mean, how often it happens that you are getting the generic <coughs> to talk? So, yeah, this is hard to train. Uh, so, this is the next slide, which is about the. Uh, it's hard to train in multiple ways. Oh. It's hard to train in multiple ways. So, the first way is like if you just train it like we did yesterday, it will not train well for you. So you need to do a bit of things, and one thing is the curriculum learning. So you first train on short numbers, and when it gets good, you start training on longer numbers. That's called curriculum training. Um, the second thing is like we said that all these layers, they share parameters. But it turned out at that time that it was better to not share them. So you start training a network that's not recurrent. It just has 10 different sets of parameters but you add a loss saying that they should be close by. And as you train, you increase this loss and bring them together. So uh, that's the relaxation. Then there is dropout applied on the recurrent connection. So in every step, you drop out some of the things and that seems to help. And we were also adding noise to the gradients, uh, forcing saturation of the sigmoids. There was a lot of tuning. Yes, so now, like, so this is how we did it. And even with this, only like one of one in 500 networks would generalize really well. Um, and then. Oh, a single training. So that was still done in the CPU age. So a single training nowadays would be like minutes. But then we had colleagues from Riga who wrote the paper about improved neural GPU a year ago or so. And they do away with almost all of the tricks. Uh, they leave the saturation, but, uh, which I believe is also not necessary. But they do away with almost all of the tricks and their models train almost every time. So the saturation was again the sigmoids? The sigmoids, they saturate on their own. You don't need to force them. But. Uh, I, I believe, but they still do, and uh, so like, but this noise added to gradients not needed. Dropout on recurrent also not needed. Uh, parameter sharing not needed. Uh, curriculum learning uh, still helps a lot, but if you tune a lot, not needed. So. So gate. So these gates are sigmoids, right? So gate cutoff means instead of being a sigmoid, you do 1.2 sigmoid minus 0 0.1. So now this thing is between 1.1 and minus 0 0.1. And if it's anything 
above 1.1 or anything below zero, you just cut it off. So it's like two, two ReLUs on the sides. So it saturates easier. It can very easily be just one or just zero. Um, yeah, so it, it seemed at that time that it helped. I know now that it's not needed. Um, they use a different saturation thing. They use like a slight extra loss to make it saturate. Um, so as you see, there is a lot of tweaking. Uh, looking at it back two years later, almost all of these tweaks are not really needed. They were like needed to push it. The master trick is to use a different optimizer. <laughs> so they use Adamax, which is a special optimizer, uh, similar to Adam, but with a different thing. If you use a better optimizer, then you can forgo a lot of the tricks. Um, you, were, you were using what? Uh, I was using Adam. Oh, and the Adamax was uh, that, that better? That Adamax is, is way better for these tasks, yes. Okay. So that's... Is it the, the no, there is... Uh, there is a special convolutions that keep one diagonal clean. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's certainly a paper worth reading, this improved neural GPU. Um, yeah, so, so, so they do a little bit of different tricks, but uh, I, I, I think Adamax, so one thing to always remember is that a better optimizer can sometimes do wonders, and people continue working on optimizers, and it's very hard to make one optimizer that's good for all problems, but sometimes trying all 10 for your problem might help a lot, especially in these algorithmic tasks. On more real world tasks and simpler <coughs> architectures, it makes less of a difference. Um, yes, and as, nowadays there are like methods that also look not just at the gradients, but at the Hessians, at the second order derivatives, and they do even better on, on some tasks like that, but anyway. Um, so yeah, um, so that's how you can actually, to my big surprise, learn things even as complicated as, as long multiplication. Yes? Yes, yes. So the original name was convolutional GRUs and then Yes, yeah, so for me, a convolutional RNN is any RNN gate that just replaced fully connected by convolutions. So you can have convolutional LSTMs, convolutional GRUs, convolutional whatever, yes. Um, okay, so, um, so that, was, uh, that, 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 that was the think about the neural GPU, and I think now it's time to make your own, but since it took a lot of tweaking, so maybe we'll not go as far as to go the do the full neural GPU. Uh, but there, uh, there is, in the collab, let's try to, you know, get some more intuition of how, how to do the sequence models. Oh, it's actually already here. So the problem I want to look at is the problem uh, the following, we'll take a sequence of bits and we'll just take the bits on the even positions and repeat them. Okay, it's, it's a toy problem. You could come up with any problem you want. Uh, so this is a generator for this. Uh, we take, say, 10 random bits, right? 10 random integers uh, between 0 and 1. Then we pick the even ones. Uh, and just repeat them. So if this is the input sequence, then the, oh, I cannot see the targets here, but um, these are the even ones repeated. So one, one, zero, 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 one, one, zero, zero, because the even ones were here. So. Is the, is the task setting clear? Okay, this is a very easy problem. This is something that you'd think that a single convolution layer can solve, right? Because, 
Uh -huh. Can you repeat the descriptions, the description yep. of, the, of the sequence? Like, is it, when you were saying even one, did you mean like the, the position? Yes. So if we have one, uh, zero, zero, one, then I would pick the even positions and just repeat them twice. Because I want something that has the same length okay. to just be aligned, yep. right? It, it's a task especially chosen so that the convolution should handle it easily because it just needs to, you know, if, it, if it's a convolution, it just needs to pick this thing, right? It's, it's a toy task especially chosen to make it easy. It's a sequence task, but one, well, not identity, but <laughs> something to, to make it easy for a convolutional network. Uh, so that's our generator and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll need to connect and run. Uh, yep, you can also con make a copy, uh, connect on your own and run and see if uh, if that works for you. So while this is running, we can look at the model. So I hope you still remember from yesterday, like we reset the graph. Now when you, when you make a data set of tensors from a Python generator, you need to tell TensorFlow what types and what shapes the, the things will have. So you need to have a dictionary of types and shapes so it's all integers, and in TensorFlow, it's sometimes better to use in 64. That's why it's there. And then the training data and they will be just a, this tensor queue generated from a Python generator. Uh, that, that's how you do it, right? And then exactly the same as yesterday, we'll just batch, take batches of 100. And then this one-shot thing is our train and eval tensor. Um, is, is that clear? That's it's very similar to yesterday. And now our model, so we will reshape our input to be batch size by 10. And then to, to be able to use 2D convolutions, we'll have the second dimension that's one. Right, so, so this is the input sequence, still integers reshaped to batch size by 10 by 1. Okay, and then, so we want to, these are integers, these are zeros or ones, right? But what we want is a embedding vector representing them, and that's the first step, we just make a one hot uh, thing. Well, I, I did it to 10 because I thought these are digits, but this should be actually two. Right, it's either zero and one. So the one hot thing, it takes a ve vector of integers that's between zero and this number, minus one, and makes a one hot thing, meaning it's one on the axis where the integer falls and zero on the other. Is the one hot thing clear? Okay, I see no. <laughs> um, So imagine you have a tensor of, of size uh, of integers, one, seven, three. Okay, uh, or maybe one, two, three. And what you want is vectors. So every vector will have three positions. It will be, uh, Every vector will have four positions, zero, one, two, three, right? And for one, it will be 0, 0.0 here, 1.0 here, right? This vector will be point zero. So it's a tensor that has one more dimension. It will be the last dimension. And it's just one hot, meaning it's hot, meaning the one is on the index that's given by this integer. So it's like the reverse of argmax later. Um, so that's what it does. And then 
these one hot vector, we want to embed them, which we do by just multiplying by a matrix. So after this multiplication, every of this symbol will be represented by a vector of 32 floating point numbers. And that's what we call, like in NLP tasks, this is often called word embeddings. Because if you have words that are integers, uh, then after the multiplications, these are the dense vectors that embed them after this. Uh, so here we do it by making the one hot and embedding, but if you had a lot of values, like not from zero and one or 30, but say 100,000, then you maybe would not want to construct the one hot things and then multiply by a matrix, but just pick out. Because what happens here, right, when you multiply a one hot vector by a matrix, is you're actually just picking one of the vectors from the matrix. So you can speed it up by just picking up the right column. But, and yeah, but for this small size, it doesn't matter. So th this says how many values. This is this size, the last dimension. So this is how many digits appear in your data. So we have only zeros and ones. That's why I can say two. But if we had digits from zero to nine, then it would need to be 10. Which 10? This one? Oh. So this 10 and the two, they're exactly the same as here. So we are picking numbers between zero and one, that's why it's two, and the length is 10. So, you know, um, just to, uh, again, to, to repeat what the task is, right? You're taking the even numbers, in this case, the two zeros, and just duplicating them, right? Maybe it's more clear uh, here. Okay, so let's come back to 10. Um, so now what will our model be? We have this data and we'll, it's a very simple model. We'll apply a 2D convolution, taking this vector, convolving, and the kernel will be three by one. And then padding same, so when you apply a convolution, Right, a convolution, a three by one convolution is like this. The question is what happens with the first and last element? Because you want something of the exactly same size as your input, but the convolution, right, there is no left element here and there is no right element here. So padding equals same just says that it makes an additional zero here and a zero here. Right, so both one on the left and one at the right, it makes zeros. Uh, and then activation means after that it will give a ReLU. So that, that's our con convolution layer. And then we'll have the output layer, which is a one by one convolution. It's the same as a dense layer. It just takes what this previous thing produced and makes it to the probabilities of the one of the 10 classes. Same as yesterday. <laughs> Oh, because conf2d is standard and conf1d, I'm, I think now it is in TensorFlow layers, but it used not to be. It is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it just used not to be there for a while. I, I think now it's there. So it's a, it's a habit. <laughs> but also like if you, if you made it to work on images, you, you could use like exactly the same thing. But yes, we should probably move to conf 1D here. Um, okay, and then cross entropy, same as yesterday, you have your vector of 10 values. Uh, you put a softmax to, to make them probabilities and the loss will be the probability of the current one, the minus log probability. And accuracy, we check how many of the digits we predicted are actually equal to the ones. 
So this is all exactly the same as yesterday. And let's train. Uh, let's see how it's training. So yeah, the accuracy goes up. So something good's happening. And goes up, goes up. And it seems to stop at around 77 or 80. So we thought it will be an easy problem for convolution, uh, but it doesn't seem to work. We have, oh yeah, we should put a two, you're right. So we were outputting, uh, we were outputting something of size 10, where we were, sh or should output, That's, is that what you mean? Yeah. yeah, you're right, let's rerun this. So uh, first question, how comes it worked? Does anyone know? So we were outputting more outputs than we needed. And the network just very quickly learned to never output the other ones, right? So, uh, so that's why that worked. Um, now with two, we still have the problem. The accuracy is like 80%, meaning we're still mispredicting 20% of the digits. So what's happening? We were supposed to learn this simple thing Right, where the convo. Ah, of course. How is the network supposed to know? Because it's supposed to do, like, pick the one to the left on even positions and pick the same one on odd ones. But how is the network supposed to know which position is even and which one is odd? So, uh, let's try to give it this information, right? Since you can give it this information by just having a trainable variable for positions. Well, we know the length is 10, right? So we'll just have, this variable will be also of length 10, and we'll have a vector of size 32, so we can just add it to the, to the x, right? So we'll take our inputs and learn for every position, because they're from 0 to 10, we'll learn a vector saying, oh, this is position one, this is position two, it will be a learnable vector. So if we do that. It doesn't anything about the vector being ah, okay. It's just a trainable variable. We can't, we can't, I mean, that we, we believe that it will help, but there is no reason to read uh, Yeah, it will be used for anything, but as you can see, Apparently, it's used for something good because we're getting 100% accuracy. Oh, this is validation level. It, it doesn't overfit in this case. But this does not work for a longer sequence, right? Yes, so this works for sequences of length 10, but the 10 is hard-coded in the parameters now. So now this is not a Turing machine or whatever. It only works for sequences of length 10. A graph of uh, what sense? Like of TensorFlow has this graph thing that you can automatically draw to visualize the network. So there is yes, there is something called TensorBoard, uh, which like when you're doing training runs in an environment where like they're running on a server and you want to just see your losses and the graphs of the network and, and things like that, then there is a tool called TensorBoard, which gets all the summaries during the runs and the graphs of the network and more and more data, and it presents it to you. So, uh, but it's, it's not hooked up into the call app. Oh. So, so I think there is some way, but, but uh, yeah, I don't know how to extract it. Uh, I could show you the interface, but I think the Wi-Fi is failing. Wi-Fi or VPN or something. But anyway, maybe it will load. But yeah, I think we're also supposed to make a break. Yeah. Um, well, but yeah, give give me one second. 
So yeah, so you saw the collab and the things we'll do after the break so you can start thinking about it. So you, you saw the network for the single problem and it has the fixed positional information problem, right? How can we get over it? So think about methods. How would we tell the network what a position it is? So maybe we can just add some number, like the position or the position normalized, something like this. Maybe instead of that, we can run a small RNN on the positions. So that's what we want to try in the exercises. And now, what if we were like to repeat the digits three-way back instead of the fun? So one convolution wouldn't do. Maybe we could do a recurrence, like in the neural GPU. Uh, so one thing you could already look up is in the TensorFlow to do recurrence, there is a function called tfscan. So in the exercises, we'll need to use it. And it's more of a functional approach to doing loops. So, so we'll need to read up on this and see how that works. And then, yeah, so after the break, we'll try to make the network work for the task without like a fixed positional embedding. And we'll try to use some simple RNNs and to think with recurrence over the thing. So you can start thinking about it and then ask questions first and then we'll make the exercises. Uh, the break for now. So the break is one hour. Break. There's a cold buffet in front of the, of, of the lecture.